space physics at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA, obviously. He's also a senior researcher at the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that certainly many of you know in Pasadena, a very nice place. I've been there also a number of times, and it's really a great place. So this is part of Caltech also. Yes. Before, he was an associate professor at the University of Florence, also a nice place. And even before he was in Giro, like he told me, so in Tour du Monde, he was a, post, a postdoc in several places, in Paris, in Scotland, and, and, and more places. So you had both good and bad weather. And, uh, right. <laughs> and he obtained originally his PhD from the Pisa University, a very historical place. And today he's, of course, PI, co-PI, co-I, in a large number of space missions, of which we're certainly going to hear in, uh, in, in your talk. Yes. And at the moment, he is uh, at the uh, 2022 Johannes Geis Fellow of ESI. That's why, that's not only why, but this is a good reason, additional reason to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Please. Thank welcome. you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I thought I would, I would give a presentation uh, about some of the present uh, space missions uh, that have been launched. Well, it's already been five years. Uh, the solar, Parker Solar Probe was launched in 2018. So it's, it's going to go through its fifth birthday. And, but I wanted to give you an idea of you know, why, why are we sending a mission to explore our very close star, the sun. So what I'm going to do is I divided this up into um, four, four sections. Uh, one is uh, titled Sun, Solar Chrome, and Heosphere, and it's going to be a historical sketch because the field of, uh, our field of study was born together with the space age and uh, Parker Solar Probe is, in fact, the first incarnation of a mission that had been thought right at the beginning of the space age. I'll then discuss why uh, the physics of the outer atmosphere of our star uh, is interesting, uh, and in particular, the problem of the solar corona and the acceleration of a wind that arrives all the way to the Earth um, and from which we are protected thanks to the Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, then I will describe the mission uh, and, its, and its, what I call its sister mission, uh, which is mostly European Space Agency mission called Solar Orbiter, um, which has some similarities to Parker, but also some important differences, and, uh, and then some of the new observations and some of the theories, mostly old because it's, it's faster to do observations than produce new theories that make sense. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, to quote uh, Douglas Adams, far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a disregarded yellow sun, uh, is what Douglas Adams says. And indeed, the sun is a star, G2 subdwarf. It's nothing special. Uh, it's really your run-of-the-mill single star. I mean, a lot of stars are double, but the sun is single. Probably better for us, I suspect. I don't know if uh, we have any habitable planets around double stars. I don't know of any. But we don't know yet, right? Uh, and if you, we, we magnify this, this area here, the sun finds itself in a very interesting area. Most areas, I think, in the galaxy are interesting for some reason or other. Um, there is an interstellar medium. There are local bubbles. There is nebula. There are um, old all the supernova remnants, and so it's a multi-phase, complicated medium in which the sun happens to be. But we're here, and we don't feel any of that. And one of the reasons is that we live in a bubble. And the bubble is a magnetized bubble, which is generated by this emission from the sun, which is called the solar wind, and which travels at an average speed between 500 and 800 kilometers per second, and blows a hole in the interstellar medium in which the planets are orbiting. That's not the only thing it does, of course. It protects us. It protects us because the sun's magnetic field is carried out by the wind. And so that magnetic field provides a defense against uh, energetic particles coming from the universe and potentially impinging the Earth. It's interesting because you need defense against kind of the medium range energetic particles. They're very, very high energies. They go so fast, they just cross without any trouble. That's not the problem. The problem is the ones that can interact with us. Um, and 
as you can see here, we've actually know about this because we've had two spacecraft, the Voyager spacecraft, that have actually crossed what's called the termination shock. Because the flow from the solar wind is supersonic, and it hits a wall, the interstellar medium, it has to decelerate, and then it encounters the interstellar medium. So we're, we don't even think there's a real bow shock anymore, um, thanks to the observations from Voyager. But I'm going ahead of myself. So since we're going to be discussing about the sun, let me remind you about what the sun is. The sun is just a giant ball of hydrogen and helium gas kept together by gravity. And so it has a core where reactions are occurring. And there's a very large slice or shell called the radiative zone where all the heat and energy generated by the thermonuclear reactions propagates outward very slowly through radiation. But then the temperature gradient becomes too violent. It's as though you put water on a, on a flame. And so thermal conduction is no, and radiation is no longer efficient enough. And so the sun starts bubbling, convecting, not bubbling, convecting. So just like when you have your soup, the hot liquid rises, oscillates, and then cools off and falls back down. And that uh, leads to the visible surface, which is called the photosphere. And the photosphere is where the classical stellar physics uh, says the sun should end. That's where zero pressure should happen. That should be the end of the star. But as you know, there's stuff outside. And we've known this for thousands of years. Now just to remind you a few things, uh, apart from the escape speed from the sun, which is if you're sitting at the surface of the sun, you need to be accelerated to 618 kilometers per second to be able to leave. Uh, we're not really interested that much. Nobody's going to stand on the sun, so the fact that g is 28 times the gravity on the Earth is not that important. It rotates at the equator in 24 and a half days. You'll normally see written down 26 because that's the period as seen from Earth, which is going around the sun. Um, and the other really important number is that life on Earth comes from radiation from the sun's photosphere, the surface of the sun that we see. And that gives us the famed 1.36 kilowatt per square meter at the Earth which is called the solar constant. And it's called the solar constant because it fortunately doesn't change, and it hasn't changed for a long, long time. The changes in that number are one, two, three, four, five uh, um, uh, digits beyond that three, six. But, interestingly, that depends, the integral is important, but it also depends how it's distributed in wavelength. And as we shall see, the sun is not just, you know, we see the sun is a, as a white object in the sky because the, basically its maximum emission makes it look white, but it also emits um, in other wavelengths. Now, that the sun didn't end where it's supposed to end has been known for a very long time. Whether that you saw on the outside was, happened to be something that was about the sun or about something else, of course, was under debate um, uh, throughout forever. And it was only relatively recently um, the century that it was really understood that what you were actually seeing here was gas that was sitting outside the sun at a temperature of above a million degrees. So this was the 40s, um, not a happy period for the world. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, you see that it's very, very structured. Now if you take up gas at a million degrees, the gas is completely ionized. Um, and so you imagine a gas, a very hot gas, and it should just be a round ball. It should be homogeneous. You shouldn't see structure in it. But it's clearly structured by something. And this something, as you can guess, is the magnetic field. So the sun is a magnetized star, even though its magnetism is not particularly strong, it's still got some very important things. Now I'm showing this picture here because this is a picture from a cell phone of the same eclipse. It was the only eclipse I've ever witnessed live, and I have to say it's spectacular. But the interesting bit is that your eye sees it much more like this than like this, because your eye catches structure. So if you um, ever need to see an eclipse or want to go see an eclipse, I suggest you get binoculars, regular binoculars that you only point to the sun during the eclipse, during totality, not outside totality, otherwise you'll do what Trump does. But, um, <laughs> Uh, during totality, with a pair of binoculars, you see an image which is basically like this. It's, it's really amazing. It is really incredible. With some stars behind it, probably, as well. You'll notice there's some, something which is not quite right here and here. This reddish stuff 
this reddish stuff that you see is reddish and it's called the chromosphere for this reason. It's some cold material, relatively cold, up to 10,000 degrees, but it's sitting in this atmosphere so of above a million degrees. And we'll see that um, this stuff is also important. Now, the structure is provided by the magnetic field. Now, in 1958, 16 years after this, realizing that there was a gas at above, 10, uh, above a million degrees, Chapman and Cowley concluded the Earth had to be immersed in the static atmosphere of the sun, because the scale height becomes so humongous that you know, the density should survive. So the Earth shouldn't be in a void orbiting around the sun, but it should be sitting in the outer corona. But they derived a density which was very high. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, Biermann, a, a German astronomer, looking at comets, had seen that comets' tails come in two varieties. There is a comet tail that bends, following something like the orbit of the comet, and it's made up of dust. Um, and of course, the shape here really depends on the speed and also the effect of the radiation of the sun on the dust. But there's also another tail that you could hear in all its beauty and color, which goes straight anti-solar. And this blue is because it's made up of highly ionized um, oxygen, typically. And what's really happening is, he said, well, this is, why is this going away like this? And that's because being ionized, it rapidly picks up the electric field is present in the outflowing plasma from the sun is accelerated to the speed of the solar wind. And he estimated that there had to be something called solar corpuscular radiation at about 470 kilometers per second. So here we have a very famous uh, physicist, Chapman and uh, Cowling, saying that the solar atmosphere is static. And then we have Biermann saying, wait a minute, when we see comets, there's a flow, so chances are there's got to be something moving outwards. And right at the same time, of course, the space age is born. And I like to show this, and many of you have seen this because I show this slide all the time. So on October 4th, um, the Soviets launched Sputnik, Korolev launched Sputnik. And it's, the history is told in many different ways, but I find it interesting that even though there had been a war and both the Soviets and the Americans had rushed to try to catch von Braun, they didn't really believe this was going to work going into space. And so Korolev was actually working with a small group of people. And when he launched Sputnik, eh, the Soviets didn't really care that much. They cared after they saw this. Because the New York Times went into defense mode. It had to protect the Americans from the fear of a satellite. So it writes a whole article saying that military experts have said the satellites would have no practicable military application in the foreseeable future. Can't carry bombs, can't carry pictures, can't do anything wrong. It's only useful to study the sun, which is also, I find, interesting because people had understood, studying radio waves during the Second World War, that the sun emitted all sorts of stuff that they hadn't known about. And so it actually provides the initial, you know, this defense, which is clearly false, is trying to calm the Americans. Um, public, but it, you know, it's, it defines a, a science program, and that we should be working on the problem of sending missiles and men into the vast reaches of the solar system. We need to figure out how we can protect ourselves from the sun and the problems there. And it's only the day after that Pravda realizes, aha, if the Americans are upset, we must have done something really exceptional. <laughs> and so they publish and it becomes a big deal, and you know, of course, Korolev becomes a hero of the Soviet Union. And right exactly in the same year, or um, a little bit later, Gene Parker publishes this paper, Dynamics of the Interplanetary Gas and Magnetic Fields. And Gene Parker is here seen discussing with me at the launch of Solar Probe. He was still alive. He unfortunately passed away last year. And this was just a little bit beforehand with myself and a few PhD students. Um, in his later years, uh, Gene was such a myth in the field of astrophysics that few young people would go and talk to him. And so uh, he would find himself alone at a conference at lunchtime. But he knew me, and so I said, Marco, come to lunch. And so first day I go to lunch. The second day he wanted to go to lunch again. And, and kind of at the end, I, after a couple of times, I 
lost of things to discuss over lunch. <laughs> and being Italian, I like to talk. I can't eat lunch silently. So I grabbed my students and I said, now you're all coming to, <laughs> with me to lunch, and you're going to each tell Parker what you're doing. And in fact, Gene was so interested in some of the work, which regards some of the things I'm going to tell you about. His final uh, active scientific research paper was written together with Franco Rapazzo, who was a PhD student of mine. And so that was a very nice thing uh, with which to conclude kind of the collaboration, scientific collaboration. We always had discussions that were, you maybe can't tell, but you should be able to tell that we didn't quite get along perfectly. Um, uh, I would always kind of challenge Parker because he had sweeping conclusions that um, often were not supported by the detailed mathematical calculations. He had an extreme physical intuition, and a lot of the results that he showed, including here, are in the end correct. But the reasons they're correct did not be found inside the paper. <laughs> okay. Now, soon after that, um, of course, the Americans formed NASA because they can't get a rocket up. And so uh, they decided the Air Force has to stop fighting with the Navy and they've got to get their act together. And so in June of 1958, NASA is born with the Space Act. And already in October 1958, the Simpson Committee says that one of the first things that has to be done is to send a solar probe inside the orbit of Mercury to study the particles and fields in the vicinity of the sun. The, the emissions from the sun were so important that it, they wanted to do that. In the meantime, the Russians kept going, and they wanted to crash instrumentation onto the moon. Unfortunately, they missed. And their first lunar satellite missed the moon by a couple of lunar radii. It's not easy to hit the moon. We don't, they didn't, you know, our cell phones have a better computer than the best computer we had in the 60s. So, in fact, the ingenuity of the calculations that were being done, of course, is fundamental. So um, they missed, and it made the first measurements of what is now called the solar wind that had been predicted by Parker and was measured soon after, 1959, by Luna 1, uh, also known as, because it became the first human-made satellite of the sun, because it escaped the Earth, and it became called, uh, its official name was turned into Mechta, which means the dream because it was the first satellite orbiting. Soon after, of course, programs, you know, the Explorer 1 was, was, was uh, launched at the same time, essentially, and measured the radiation belts. And then Mariner made the more detailed measurements, and this is Marcia Neugebauer, who's a former investigator, and that's their press conference in 1962. And it showed that there was a continuous outflow, and Mariner 2 was going to Venus. And so we see the distance. This is the distance from the sun measured in astronomical units. One is Earth. 0.76 is um, Venus, and you see this continuous, well, continuous. You have points with flow speeds measured between 400 and all the way up to um, 700 kilometers per second. And so that proved that there is a continuous outflow from the sun called the solar wind that Parker had predicted. And that kind of ended the story of the discussion of whether there was a static atmosphere out of the sun or wind, even though the discussion in Parker wasn't quite right. Now, thanks to the solar wind, everything that happens on the sun is propagated outwards, and what's called the solar corona and the solar wind um, extends out through the solar system, and we now call this bubble the heliosphere, because it's the place influenced by the sun. Now, if you ask yourself how much of the energy that the sun emits goes into the heliosphere, it's a minuscule fraction of the energy. It's two to five thousandths of percent of the total energy in solar radiation. And so you might ask, physicists probably would ask, why are you guys spending so much money trying to study two to 5,000? And <laughs> it has to do not with the gas so much, well, although the gas is very important, but in the interactions between the gas and the magnetic field. Because these two to 5,000 of the percent of solar radiation, unlike solar radiation, is not distributed uniformly across the solar surface. It is concentrated and emitted in bursts, and these bursts can have immense amount of energy, of course, because we, 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 I've told you how much energy the sun emits itself. And so, in fact, the magnetic field plays a fundamental role in mediating this energy release in a way which is uh, bursty, explosive, and can damage um, satellites and influences everything that's happening in the solar system. We know that the heliosphere extends to about 100 astronomical units. Okay, the pictures of the corona that I showed you 
show you a very beautiful and laminar thing. Um, now we have satellites, of course, that take pictures of the sun and x-rays all the time. And um, this is what you see. This is a typical image of the sun and x-rays. And what you see is that this, the photosphere looks dark because it's so cold. It's only 6,000 degrees centigrade. And so it's dark in x-rays. But the corona is bright. And you can see that it is never quiet. It's always changing continuously. This is, you can tell the passage of days here. You can see solar rotation. So remember from here to here, it's about 12 day, 13 days, okay? 13 days. So you can kind of see <coughs> things are happening all over the place with uh, stuff being emitted, but you see that it's, you see loops. It really looks like that you're seeing magnetized material, following loops and things like that. And what I'm showing you now here, in red and blue, are magnetograms using the Zeeman effect. You can measure the magnetic field. George Ellery Hale invented the heliospectrograph in um, 19, I think 15, if I'm not mistaken, maybe earlier. Uh, and we've been measuring magnetic fields on the surface of the sun since then. And so you can see that the two polarities, positive and negative, are indicated in red and blue. And you can see that the sun is basically a mixture of red and blue all over the place except at the poles where you see one pole dominated by blue and the other dominated by red. So it's basically a dipole, but with an immense amount of multiple polarities. And these pictures are in two different wavelengths that measure different temperatures, and red is basically a million degrees, and in green is two million degrees. And you see that the corona has these things sitting outside that are called prominences that are quite cold, and around them there are cavities that are green, that are you know, hotter, and that the coronal holes, these regions where the field is coming out, that I call coronal holes, and I'll find them in a second, are, tend to be cooler than where these arches of gas are closed, and that's called the, sort of the solar atmosphere, which is hot. So, problem number one, you have a star, the engine is at the center, the surface is at 6,000, this is less than 6,000 degrees centigrade. Um, why on earth is there a 2 million degree gas sitting outside? It cannot be thermodynamic. Heat flows from hot to cold. Heat cannot be conducted from the photosphere upwards unless we find a specific non equilibrium mechanism, which might exist and we will discuss briefly later on. But if not, if you're thinking in any kind of classical way, the only way you can make this hot is by dissipating, bringing energy up and dissipating in this very low density medium to create this high temperature. Now, a, a gas at a 2 million degrees threaded by a magnetic field, and I hope I don't offend anyone, but it's important to, to define things. It's called a plasma. It was defined in the early 20th century um, because the magnetic field gave this gas the behavior of something a bit sluggish that reminded people of plasma in blood. And uh, a plasma is different from a gas. The behavior of a plasma is completely different and very anti-intuitive compared to a standard gas. Why? Well, first of all, in a normal gas, if you go faster, you collide more. Just like uh, people <laughs> in a movie theater, for example, suppose you're trying to get yourself to the exit at the end of a movie. If you run, you're going to hit more people than if you move slowly. Um, but in a plasma, because the collisions are mediated by the um, Coulomb force, it's as though people became smaller if you move faster. People shrink if you move faster. And so this movie theater full of big fat people if you're going 10 times the thermal speed, it looks like little sticks, and you don't collide anymore. Faster particles collide less. And now if you add an electric field, they can accelerate more easily because they don't collide. They're going a little bit faster. You put an electric field, you accelerate them, hey, they're not going to collide with anyone anymore. And you can have an effect called runaway. So this is very anti-intuitive. Thermodynamics is Robin Hood. You steal from the rich, to give to the poor so that on average we have a nice. But in a plasma, if you're a little bit richer, you steal from the poor 
and become more rich. It's an inverse Robin Hood. It's, uh, I'm not going to say Republican, but anyway. <laughs> charged particles to lowest order must follow the magnetic field lines. If you have a magnetic field lines, charged particles rotate around the field. If you're negative, you rotate. If this is the field direction in the right hand sense. If, it's, uh, if you're a positive particle, you rotate with a left hand sense. And you're sluggish. You can't move across the field. You can only move across the field if the field is moving with you. It's as though these are wires. But they're only wires across. A particle can smoothly run up and down field lines without any trouble. There's no force. So that means that charged particles slow us don't follow field lines. Magnetic field lines, on the other hand, must follow charged particles. And who wins in this tug of war depends on whether there's more energy in the particles or more energy in the field. Some of you might say, but there is no energy in the field. The field is the energy is in currents. Yes, but the currents generate a field, and the, cool, and the Lorentz force involves the magnetic field. In any case, the result is that particles have to follow fields to lowest order. The magnetic fields follow the charged particles. And it's not like when we study electromagnetism in school, where you have a circuit, and you define the fields, and the particles just move around in the wires. The field that we're talking about is the field generated by the motion of those particles, self-consistently. So, it's the self-consistent magnetic field that provides structure and confinement. In other words, particles and fields are inextricably intertwined, and I think the best way to understand what it must feel like to be a particle in a plasma is to try to repeat these two words quickly 10 or 15 times. <laughs> That'll give you an idea of what it means to be a plasma in a magnetic field. Now, at the same time, and this is why I go through the history, because it's beautiful, magnetic fields were being attempted to be used to create useful fusion machines on the Earth. This property of plasmas was attempted as a way to confine high temperature gases to get fusion to work. And so machines were invented. And at first, all of this was covered by secret. And then, in the early 50s, the Soviets and the Americans realized this is far away. We might as well allow this to be the scientists to talk to each other. And uh, this is my only comment on all this, is that even in the worst period of the Cold War, um, the scientists and the physicists in the West and the East communicated with each other in a co very collaborative way, sometimes more openly than could be imagined. And that's how the study of this particular field started. Um, the physics of plasmas was born in these years, and it was born really in a, in a, through the collaboration between these competing uh, worlds. And so the Russians invented what's called the tokamak, which is essentially a chamber with a self-consistent, with an outside coil that produces a magnetic field. Then you drive an electric field, you accelerate particles, and you create a self-consistent loop. And we saw on the sun there are things that look like loops. And the currents that form in these systems are the ones which carry the energy, of course, of the magnetic field and can store it and disrupt it. Uh, we don't have fusion on the Earth today, uh, confined fusion. We can make bombs, but we can't do fusion. And the collaboration between physicists studying the solar corona and fusion physicists is something which is still happening. Because the sun provides magnetic field configurations that are very general. And some of the phenomena that occur on the sun are the, some of the phenomena that occur inside these machines that stop them from working. In particular, one of the concepts which is really important is the concept of magnetic reconnection and current sheets. So when you have two currents, parallel currents, in two wires, you know, they attract each other. When you have opposite currents, they repel each other. Now imagine you're a plasma. So the current is volume filling. It's moving all over the place. Now suppose I make a bit stronger current here. That's going to want to collapse, typically. Something has to stop it from collapsing. And that can either be pressure or the fact that the magnetic field and the plasma is like a very good conductor, so you can't really break magnetic field lines. They're like wires. And so if you try to bring two currents together, the magnetic field between them will pile up, and nothing will happen until the currents become sufficiently strong 
at which point all hell breaks loose in what's called a process called magnetic reconnection. Okay, so why on earth does the sun make a wind? And this is what Parker came up with. Well, the reason it creates a wind is because it's a plasma. Let me explain. At one million degrees, the speed of a proton is about 100 kilometers per second. That's way too low to escape the sun. But an electron is free. They're disconnected. And the electron is 2,000 times lighter. So its <coughs> thermal speed is 42 times, 41 times faster. And so its speed is 4,100 kilometers per second. And so the electron can escape. But if the electron escapes, forget about the magnetic field for now, it's going to charge the sun. That means that an electric field is going to be set up that's going to pull out the protons and drag back the electrons. And the net result of that is that if the temperature in the system falls off slower than 1 over r, then if it's not moving, the density will be so big and the temperature will be so big that far away there's going to be a finite pressure. But far away from the sun, there's the interstellar medium, which is... Parker said, empty. So there's no way a static atmosphere could fit. That's why you blow a wind. And that's what he said. This is the conclusion of his paper. It's, you conclude that probably it's impossible to look around or indeed perhaps the atmosphere of any star to be in complete hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's the essence of the Parker argument. Why, why are plasmas important? It's because the details of the calculation depend on the thermal conductivity being proportional to temperature to the five halves. The reason that the thermal conduction goes up with temperature precisely due to the fact that the collisions go down with velocity. It's the same, it's the same exact reason. Okay, so now, this is the only equation I will show. The equation that describes the solar wind expansion is the equations of a de Laval nozzle, in which you have a hot gas and a set cro an effective cross section that decreases and then re expands. That is exactly the supersonic jet engine, or generally a jet engine, um, where you have a minimum in the cross-sectional area, and you transform the disordered thermal energy into ordered fast flow. And this is the equation, where the cross-section here is made up of a combination of the cross-section of the expanding gas, because remember, the gas has to carry the magnetic field with it, so it doesn't necessarily expand radially. If there are field lines, it has to kind of organize itself. And the gravitational attraction. And that produces a sonic point, and so the flow velocity looks like this. It accelerates. There's a point where the Mach number becomes one. This is the Mach number. It's a function of distance from the sun. And in this particular case, it's a, a, it's a corona at about one million degrees. You get a a sonic point about 10 solar radii, and then continues to accelerate outward. If the flow speed or the pressure at infinity isn't like that, then you get what are called breezes, and then there are other solutions that we don't really care about, except that the devil is in the details. And in this particular case, the devil was played by Leon Mestel, who was a very famous stellar astrophysicist, who spoke to another very well-known fluid dynamicist whose name was Paul Roberts. Uh, they both passed away very recently, and so I'm showing the pictures for this reason. I have the utmost respect for these astronomers. So they, actually, Mestel didn't even write this paper, but he's quoted at the beginning of this paper. And Mestel said, were the temperature at the base of the solar corona 10 to the 5 Kelvin rather than the generally accepted 10 to the 6, the pressure far from the sun, because there is an interstellar medium, there's all these gases emitted from other stars would be sufficient to suppress the solar wind entirely. So when I read that in the introduction of this paper, well, somebody had asked me on a train, why is the solar wind supersonic? And I had given the Parker answer. And I wasn't really convinced, so I started looking at this again. And when I read this, I said, uh-uh, ah, something's wrong here. And it turns out the story was a lot more subtle than that. Stars can also have material falling on them, a process called accretion. And a very famous astrophysicist named Bondi had described the flows. And you can see this picture looks just like the picture I showed you before, but it's in the opposite sense. Anyway, that's a long story short. It turns out that, in reality, stars either have winds, 
and then to meet the interstellar medium they make a shock. If they don't do that, material has to fall on top of them. It's not possible to live in between. Basically because we have, we're dealing with supersonic flows and supersonic flows don't know what the state of the system far away is. That's why there's a shock. There's no communication between the interstellar medium and the star. So what happens is basically the solar wind the you know, supersonic has a shock, and if things change, the change propagates up to the shock, and it pushes the shock inside or outside. And basically, the sun allows the shock to come in, come in, come in, until it reaches the sonic point. And when the shock reaches the sonic point, if the pressure outside goes up just a little bit, there's communication between the sun and the interstellar medium, because now the sun knows, because a sound wave can propagate in a subsonic wind all the way back to the sun. And the sound wave tells the, the sun, uh-uh, my pressure is way too high for you. And therefore, everything collapses to supersonic accretion with the shock. And so the process is not, you know, sun, just the sun can't do it, help it. It either blows out a supersonic wind or it has a shock. Now, again, I know I'm going very slow. And uh, I apologize, so I will show you some excellent movies and data in a second. But again, to appreciate what's going on, I have to show you what happens to the sun. I suppose the sun is just a simple dipole and then you try to blow a wind out. Well, how can the wind blow across here? It, in order to blow across here, it has to drag the magnetic field with it. Here it's okay. You know, this field line goes all the way to infinity, so a flow can go out. So what happens? It blows out the field. It drags the field out like this. And now, interestingly, what will you see? You will see that you have one field line dragged out like this. Suppose this is the north. This is now the south pole from the drawing. So the field here is going in. But the field here is going out. And the plasma is moving out. But how can you have a field going in here and going out here? If the field is going one way on one side and the other way on the other side, there is a current. So part of the energy that goes into coronal heating and blowing out the wind gets reabsorbed by a current that has to generate this magnetic field. So the solar wind contains an energy source as it propagates out. There is a current going around the sun in what's called the heliospheric current sheet. Now, unfortunately for us, the sun's dipole is tilted with respect to the rotation axis, creating a humongous mess. So let's imagine a sprinkler now that is angled, and so what's going to happen is that sheet of current, which is here in purple, is going to be warped, what used to be called the ballerina skirt, but we can't call it that anymore. <laughs> okay. All right, keep this in mind. So what does the real solar wind look like? Well, a very important mission called Ulysses, of which um, Johannes Geis was one of the principal investigators um, with the measurements of composition was launched in the early 90s <coughs> and um, was the only mission to go outside of the ecliptic plane. So this mission went to Jupiter, used Jupiter gravity to get kicked out of the ecliptic plane and in fact go I think first south and then north and so on. And it measured the solar wind and it showed that solar magnetic field is not always the same. There is a change in the sunspot number with time called the solar cycle. The solar wind changes following the solar cycle. And it showed basically that at solar minimum where you had these beautiful polar things going out, the solar wind was almost constant at 800 kilometers per second. But where you ended up in the closed regions, where the wind was being dragged out, oh, all hell broke loose. You had oscillations that went from you know, 200 to 800 kilometers per second. Those oscillations that we saw in that original diagram from Mariner, because Mariner was sitting in the ecliptic plane. So it saw these variations in solar wind speed. At solar maximum, <laughs> the flow is fast, slow, <coughs> and slow. We're fast and slow, mind you. We're 800 kilometers per second. The sound speed is only about 30. So this is a more than Mach 20 flow. It's very supersonic. Um, and it's, you know, mildly supersonic when it's very slow. And then the third orbit, showing that the magnetic field 
of the dynamo flips, so the sign of the field, blue and red are the sign of the magnetic field, inward and outward, and the opposite to this happened. Okay, so now we have a general picture. We have a very fast wind coming from the poles where the magnetic field cannot confine the plasma, and at the equator where the magnetic field tries to confine the plasma, we have this bursty behavior. So, solar probe is going to go around trying to get close to the sun to understand what heats this corona and what accelerates the solar wind. So, the problem of coronal heating, I kind of summarized it earlier. The temperature goes all the way down to um, uh, temperature minimum just above the photosphere and the thing called the chromosphere, and then the temperature goes way up. And in the corona, you have the solar wind accelerating. So, the question is how does this heating happen? Who provides the energy? Well, it turns out that most of the energy is provided by the electromagnetic flux associated with the magnetic fields on the sun. It's a plasma. The plasma is moving because of convection in the sun. It drags the magnetic field with it, and that creates work that propagates into the corona and then is dissipated to heat the corona. But it's magnetic fields, so the process is not an easy-go-lucky, viscous, average thing. The energy doesn't get dissipated anywhere unless you form intense regions where it gets explosively emitted. And so coronal heating is an intrinsically bursty process. So Parker Solar Probe really wanted to determine structural dynamics of the sun's coronal magnetic field, understand how the corona and wind are heated and accelerated. And then, I didn't mention the um, solar corpuscular radiation, the high energy one, which is solar energetic particles, which are basically cosmic rays generated. So Solar Probe was to go inside the region where the magnetic field is still very strong, which means that the wind speed is smaller than the typical speed associated with the magnetic field. And we thought that distance was at about 12 solar radii, so we insisted we really wanted to go to four originally. We wanted to go to Jupiter and send a satellite that would go into four solar radii using gravity. The gravity it's hard to fall on the sun. We have such huge angular momentum, 30 kilometers per second. We, have, we can't make spacecraft. They, go 30 kilometers per second the other way so that we can fall in the sun. We can do 10 and a half, 11 point epsilon, basically. And so we can just manage to get away from the Earth. There's no way we can do 30. And so what happens is we have to go and use gravity assist either from Jupiter. But going out to Jupiter and to be deflected to go so close to the sun, you need to go really close to Jupiter. And Jupiter has a magnetosphere where all the th unhappy things that are happening in the solar corona are also happening. It's the biggest object in the solar system, apart from the sun, the Jovian magnetosphere with accelerated particles, things that could kill a spacecraft in no time. And so it would be a very dangerous mission to go close enough to Jupiter inside 10 Jovian radii to be deflected into the solar corona, number one. Number two, to do that in any kind of reasonable time frame required nuclear power. And Ulysses, I think, or maybe Cassini, was the last civilian spacecraft launched with uh, nuclear energy, radionuclear. Uh, now we only use uh, solar panels. The military continue <laughs> to use nuclear, but we're not allowed. So, and I understand it. I mean, it is. So we had to change the mission, and um, we studied orbits, and it turned out that we could use Venus, but to get close to the sun using Venus, you have to go by Venus many, many, many times. Anyway, to make a long story short, we decided that the important thing was to get inside 12. We wouldn't be able to go to 4. So we fixed it on 9.5 solar radii from solar center. Now, that's also the region where turbulence and waves and fluctuations are maximum amplitude. And it's also where the temperature maximum is and where the transition from collisions being important to no collisions is in, uh, happens. So this is a log diagram. This is distance from the sun. This is 1 AU. We measure in C2, until recently up to here, um, the temperature of various things. But we measure them indirectly, microscopy <coughs> in solar corona. What's happening between, there was a big, we don't know. Notice this important thing that happens um, in a lot of the solar wind. The electrons are quite cold. Hydrogen is hotter. Oxygen is even hotter. This was a discovery of Ulysses. Solar orbiter has very similar objectives. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to skip a few things. One important thing that was measured by Ulysses was the speed of the wind. You can see here in the dotted line. And an effective measurement 
of the electron temperature in the solar corona. So what you see now is that the highest velocity solar wind comes from regions in the corona that have the lowest temperature. And this kind of is anticlimactic if you think of the Parker solar wind where it's the electrons that are dragging everybody out. You would imagine that where the electrons are hotter, you would effectively drag the protons out more effectively. But here we're showing that, in fact, the fast solar wind comes from cold electrons. The slow solar wind comes from hot electrons. Now, if you think that the slow solar wind has to drag out the closed field, it begins to make sense. But why on Earth is the field from the coronal holes, the regions at the poles of the sun, where the electrons are cold, so fast? And we didn't have an explanation for that, and Parker had no explanation for that. So one answer is the fact that there are waves. The supersonic flow is turbulent, and you can measure a spectrum of turbulence fluctuations. This is an example at one astronomical units. So there are waves, and we knew there are waves. And these waves, they're actually, it's turbulence, but it's also waves. waves. That requires a bit of um, explanation. In hydrodynamics, Turbulence occurs when water encounters an obstacle, for example. But a single eddy does not really propagate unless there's an average flow. And if you make an eddy in your bathtub, it's just going to sit there. And if you create turbulence in your bathtub, it works. You can stir and the water becomes turbulent. In a magnetic field, the minute you torture a magnetic field line, a wave propagates. And Waves going only in one direction do not decay like eddies. They don't interact nonlinearly. They're solutions. They are like solitons. They can propagate. In order to have turbulence, you need waves going in both directions. But the turbulence you see in the sun looks like it's real turbulence, but it's made up of waves coming out from the sun. It's mostly waves coming out. So there's a mystery there. But there's a good mystery because these waves can actually push the wind and accelerate it further out. The question is, are the numbers OK? All right, I'm going to skip a few things here and, and just keep going to Parker. OK, so multiple gravity assists from Venus. Launch, it was supposed to be on July 31st, 2018. In fact, we la launched in August 12th. So we're a bit late. But believe it or not, things get faster, so we actually caught up. Anyway, our first period was November 5th. And then we met Venus again. You see flyby 16, flyby 4. Um, flyby 5 has already been through. And uh, flyby 6 is coming up. So probe is using these multiple gravity assists from Venus to fall. Every time it catches up with Venus, Venus slows it down, and it falls a little bit further into the sun. Now, you might ask, how on Earth are your instruments going to survive in a 2 million degree plasma. Well, it's not really the plasma that's worrisome. It's 500,000 degrees at the, at the uh, Earth. It's the radiation of the sun. So as you will see, the bus, where all the instruments are, has a shield on top. Uh, I don't know why that, okay. So this is a, this is a radiator um, with water, just like old car radiators. <coughs> the reason it's a radiator with water is that Water is the simplest substance that we really know, so that if we make a hole in it, we'll be able to tell that there's a hole. We will be able to understand the, the, the ions that are coming out, which are hydrogen and oxygen. This is the magnetic swing test. So the instruments are basically sitting behind, most of them. And there's a, there's a shield at the top. I hope we see the shield here in a second. This is solar panels. Solar panels are two. One set of solar panels when you're close to the sun and another set of solar panels for when you're far away. And this is the thermal shield, this huge um, octagon that was basically moved onto the bus. And um, the actual material is not um, discussable in public because it was developed by the applied physics lab through contacts also with the defense department, as you can imagine. Because this thing has to withstand uh, the radiation of um, 500 suns, because it goes to 10 solar radii. Anyway, uh, so I was supposed to tell you about the instruments. So the instruments are mostly hidden behind this shield. So that, in fact, we measure the solar wind thanks to aberration. Um, except for two things. 
electromagnetic field antenna that are sitting out front, and a small Faraday cup that collects fast plasma. So where are we in the mission? We're a little bit over halfway the uh, supposed mission, and we're our perihelia are now at 13 solar radii. Okay. We're going to do another two perihelia at 13, then we drop to 12, and then we go inside 10, 9.8 um, solar radii. And so this is um, where we are. And this is what the orbit looks like seen from a frame sitting on the sun. So now I've mapped out 360 degrees on the sun. And because probe is going slowly when it's far away, but then goes faster than the sun when it gets close, because it goes really fast, from the sun's point of view, it goes standard and retrograde. Okay. Now why am I showing you this? Let me show you it again. Hopefully it will let me play this again. It's because to measure the solar wind in this uh, system, it's really important to be able also to measure the wind that comes from the same source on the sun. So there are two intervals here. One is here, and one is here. Where probe is not moving respect to the sun from the point of view of geographical position, but it's moving very fast radially. So it's going closer to the sun, measuring plasma along the same solar wind jet, so to speak. Okay, and here we have uh, the first data that came down. I like to show this picture because it was very surprising. Um, what are we measuring here? This is the radial component of the magnetic field, BR. Okay, and as a function of time, these are what are called New York seconds. New York seconds are slightly less than a second, and they are used to avoid interference with electrical instrumentation. There's like an irrational number, like 9, 0.987, so that uh, blah, 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 so that you will not go into resonance with any circuit on the spacecraft, so you can make the measurement properly. And this is a measure of the field. So you see the magnetic field measurement of the radial component of the wind. On average, it's negative as you move closer to the sun and to perihelion, the intensity goes up. This is a nano This is about 90 nano tesla. Then it comes back up. What's going on here? Now, every few seconds, the magnetic field flaps over. BR goes from positive to negative to positive to negative. And you might think, what's going on? You might think, well, is this, are there wrinkles in this current sheet so, so fine-tuned that you're measuring these oscillations? Not really. We crossed the heosphere current sheet a couple of times, um, one time down here and another time over here. These oscillations, turns out, are not oscillations associated with a change in sign of the field, they are oscillations of an individual magnetic field line, which takes on the shape of an S. And I will tell you how we know that. So basically, the magnetic field line is at 35 solar radii. This is an outward field line. It does this. And we fly with a spacecraft like that. That is a humongous wave, <laughs> if you think of it. Um, how do we know that it's that? And that it's not this. How do we know that it's this and not this? Well, the sun emits very fast electrons. And these very fast electrons go faster than anything else, thousands of kilometers per second. And you can collect them on your detector. So if you were to look at the speed of these electrons and compare it with the sign of the magnetic field, what would happen? That when you're here, they would be aligned. And when they're here, they would be anti-aligned. So if you measure the angle between B, the magnetic field, and the beam, you would see the beam do this, and then rotate and do this. But if you're in this situation, this beam is going and so here it's going with the field, and here it's also going with the field. So there's no change in the angle. It's always a long B. And that's what we see. So we see these S-shaped forms all over the path, all over the place, that are called switchbacks. Um, this is now a measurement of the full magnetic field. So this is the radial component. And you'll notice, if you're careful, not only does this thing do this all the time, but it does it in waves. And they look like, you know, fish bones. 
But if you look at the magnitude of the field, the intensity of the field, hey, it, it, it increases slowly as you move closer to the sun, and then it decreases slowly. This black line doesn't change much. But the components change dramatically. But the total magnetic field stays constant. So we have this weird system whereby the modulus of B, the, the B is a vector, it's, it's going all over the place, but its tip is on a sphere so that the magnitude of the field is constant. Now, this is a very strange animal indeed, but it's, it's a possible mode of oscillation of a magnetic field in a plasma. We don't produce it in the lab usually, but it's the standard mode of propagation of waves from the sun, close to the sun. And these are called switchbacks. These are large amplitude, constant magnitude magnetic field oscillations that probably play a major role in pushing the solar wind out to high speeds. Now in correspondence to these magnetic field oscillations, there are jets in the speed of the wind. And those two things go together because these are waves. And so basically, the magnetic field and the velocity have to be correlated. And so when the magnetic field does all these oscillations, the velocity field does jets as well. This is, you see, the velocity field here. Corresponding to these guys, there's jets in the speed. So these are these strange, nonlinear, huge alpha waves that are spatially, have these spatial oscillations that are correlated with the dimension of giant convection cells on the sun called supergranulation. So this is one of the big discoveries of solar probe, that in fact, the solar wind is modulated by the structure of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. Um, here I'd like to mention another important scientist, Jack Gosling, who was the first to realize that these waves would produce these jets in velocity in this way. In fact, Jack tortured me because he measured these things. He saw these jets with before probe. There was another spacecraft called Helios, a German spacecraft in the 70s that went to the orbit of Mercury and saw these jets. And he kept asking me, why are these? And I, I have to tell the truth, I, I didn't know the answer and because I hadn't put the whole picture together. In fact, it was a student of mine, Lorenzo Mattini, who came up with the answer in terms of these large amplitude alpha waves. Okay. So these are waves. The velocity and magnetic field, the one is red and one is blue, you can see that they're almost perfectly correlated. So this is a wave. It's like on, on the chord of a violin. It's a wave propagating in one direction. Um, and it's coming away from the sun, always away from the sun. And yet, it has a full, well-developed spectrum, like if it was turbulence. But if it is a wave going in one direction, it cannot develop turbulence like it's supposed to. So this creates a major issue in understanding how this thing forms. Okay, I'm going to skip all sorts of things. This is just to show you supergranulation. And I want to come to a second topic as to how to form these things. There are two ideas as to how these things form. One is this process of magnetic reconnection, where field lines can be ripped open and create kinks in the field that propagate out. Or it can be the velocity field. Oops, sorry, I'm going to have to go a little bit faster. Imagine that you had a magnetic field like this and a jet, or actually a slowing down jet or a fast jet here. The, remember, the magnetic field gets carried by the velocity, and so it has to be carried upward. And as a result, you'd form a dip here, and so you'd form a structure like this. So either different jets on the sun generate this structure or magnetic reconnection. <coughs> we don't know which of the two hypotheses is correct, but by measuring how they evolve with distance, we can kind of try to figure it out. If you expected that both of these methods to make them were correct, then reconnection would generate them in the corona and that number would decrease. The ones that are generated by velocity would have to it takes time to generate these things, so they would be generated further away. And so you would have a number of these with distance that goes like this. Unfortunately, we don't really see 
we kind of see something like this here. This is the number of these animals with different time scales as a function of distance. And you can kind of see that depending on the time, shorter ones are like constant, but the longer ones seem to display some kind of minimum, um, just like this diagram. Anyway, so with probe you can do all sorts of things. Because it has this um, retrograde, prograde thing, you can actually cross the same stream twice. In fact, showing a plot that depends on time is not the right way to show it, because the spacecraft is moving this way with respect to the sun and then this way. And so it's better to make a plot from the point of view of the sun with the spacecraft going around. And if you do that, you can take the velocity measurement and reproject it, and then you can identify the same streams and measure an acceleration profile. So Probe conclusively demonstrates that the solar wind between 30 and 60 solar radii is still accelerating. And as you can see, in different streams, the acceleration is almost the same. And if you want to measure it, it's not too bad. This is about 50 kilometers per second per 50 solar radii. So it's about one kilometer per second per solar radii is the acceleration, which is, we think, associated with these very large waves propagating away from the sun. If you measure all the data of the solar wind and plot all the measurements, their speed as a function of distance, you have this cloud, but this cloud displays a very interesting minimum, which looks just like the acceleration profile of the thermal solar wind that Parker had predicted. So it seems that there is a baseline solar wind that comes from the solar corona with all sorts of junk, jets, and hot stuff being thrown out at higher speeds on top of it. All right. I mean, not bothering with too many details. Because the solar wind loses collisions, the distribution functions become crazy. You're used to seeing distribution functions of particles that are Maxwellian, like a, a bell curve. But here we have distributions that have tails along the magnetic field, which are very extended. And this is turbulence. And now I just want to go into the details of some processes that might be occurring that help to uh, uh, generate the fast solar wind. And you'll, if you focus on this region here, I don't know if you can see it here or not. There's a few jets taking off. There's one right there. Uh, you have to look at it a few times. But so we see these plumes of gas going, that appear to be going outwards. But then on top of that, we will see little jets. Let's see if we can see any. There you go. Did you see that one going out? Just focus here, and I'll show this another time. There. Did you see that thing being expelled like that? All right, so those are examples of jets being ejected. And Basically, the, the, this is what the magnetic field does. The magnetic field confines the plasma, then it loses the stability, it ejects plasma. We don't know really, very, we're just scratching the surface of these processes and how they work uh, on the sun. But putting together these images from telescopes and the in situ measurements, we are making progress, I think. So this is an example of what we think is happening. Is this movie going? I think we see one here. I forget now. Is it moving or not? Oh, there it is. There it is right there. See these little tiny loops appear to be connecting and, and, and reconnecting with each other and producing ejecta like this. And this is an example. This is a current. And once you form, the current becomes stronger than a, than a critical level. It just collapses and allows the field lines to, to break and escape. Uh, let me skip over this thing, which is complicated. Uh, just... Uh, we know that there's a dust ring uh, around the orbit of uh, Venus, and um, um, Parker Solar Probe has a telescope that uses the shield as a coronagraph. It has a white light telescope that uses the shield to look at the sky. And this is an image from the white light telescope, and it shows that there's dust along the orbit of Venus. But this particular image shows a lot of the planets, and it also shows the galaxy. That's nice. Here it was able to show all of the planets, or most of the planets. This is a view of Earth from a spacecraft. And of course it measures the intrinsic instability of that current sheet that I was telling you about that emits blobs of plasma. Uh, some of these pictures are going, some aren't. But anyway, you have to look at these 
And these are uh, problems in plasma stability that are of interest also to people working in fusion and in the laboratory. Um, and we've done some modeling of this, but I don't want to go into the details. We have these, so everywhere at the heliospheric current sheet, we see these blobs being emitted. Um, depending on, these are two satellites called stereo. They were moving away from each other and could see the same process from different points of view in the ecliptic plane. And it showed that they were fairly wide, seen from one point of view, but very narrow, seen from the other. So these are thin structures um, in space. And the process of, of a current sheet breaking apart is described in this numerical simulation. And so this is one of our contributions to the field, has been to understand how this process works. I want to show you this movie again. So what I'm showing you here is a current sheet. So this is field going one way, and this is field going the other way. And this is the current thinning and breaking. it As it breaks, it makes even thinner sheets and thinner blobs. And as the sheet breaks and makes thinner sheets and thinner sheets, the process accelerates. And it's really interesting because it, is, it leads to a catastrophe. It leads to an infinitely small size and an infinite electric field in a finite time. And so that means that if you're a particle and you happen to be here, you see a huge field, electric field, and you get accelerated very, very dramatically. So this process happens in the heliospheric current sheet. I don't know why the movie isn't going, because this is a movie. It's supposed to be a movie. Oops, sorry about that. But we form these blobs, and we, we now, the theory that we've developed actually can explain some of the periodicities seen in the emission of blobs in the heliospheric current sheet. Um, so I don't want to get into details. We actually, Parker Solar Probe actually observes the process in space happening, and it sees that because if you look at the speed of the solar wind, sometimes you see impulsive increases in the jet, and then there's increase. And that's because where the reconnection occurs, the field comes together and it produces a jet. And Parker here is crossing this, what's called a reconnection jet in the solar wind. Okay. So, this movie now is showing you what Solar Orbiter can do as it moves closer to the sun. And it's showing you how the magnetic field does not dissipate in a uniform way. And you see, it's like a series of micro explosions going on. So you have big active regions, but even in the darkest areas of the solar corona, you have these micro brightness. Okay, there you have one. And these are the energetics of these. Each one of these is several uh, uh, hundreds of times Hiroshima bombs, the smallest ones that we see, and we think there are even smaller ones. So a large solar flare, the ones that lead to things that happen at the Earth, these big clouds of plasma that get ejected to the Earth, I don't have any movies here, unfortunately, of those, uh, are the order of um, um, 10 to the 25 joules. And these ones that you see here are about 10 to the 9 times smaller. But these things are distributed in scale, and you have them happening all the time um, at different scales. From big active regions, you have big solar flares, and from small regions, you have these small micro flares and nano flares. So, orbiter and probe can work together by measuring the plasma coming away, by measuring the energetic particles along field lines. And Solar Orbiter, which goes um, all the way into the orbit of Mercury carrying telescopes, um, can actually observe um, Parker and the solar corona. And so, these two missions together over the next uh, decade, I think, will completely change our view. Now, Everything I told you was about the sun. But um, the sun, as I said, has, you know, magnetic field, the maximum magnetic field in the photosphere is maybe a few thousand gauss. Um, so maybe, is that 0.1 Tesla? Maybe half a Tesla, maybe one Tesla, some places, in the middle of a huge sunspot. But then we have, in the universe, we have other planets, giants, which have stronger magnetic fields. We have neutron stars. We have magnetars with fields that are 10 to the 10, 10 to the 14 times larger. And the plasma doesn't care about the scale. It behaves in a similar way. Currents form, the self-consistent currents and magnetic fields are stable for some time, and then they explode. The difference is that on the sun, 
they create coronal mass ejections and X-rays, but in magnetars and more exotic objects, they create gamma rays and things like that. And so all of these studies are, of course, important for astrophysics. We now know that all galaxies have a plasma halo, just like the solar wind. Even our own galaxy, outside, as soon as you move out, has a gas with lots of dense clouds sitting in it, but with a temperature above a million degrees. We know that there's a medium between galaxies which sits at 100 million degrees. So it seems that plasmas and their interaction with magnetic fields are fundamental to all the processes, and in, in the end, they are also responsible for the acceleration and the propagation of cosmic rays, which are one of the most dangerous things, of course, that we face coming from, from outside the Earth. Auroral displays are nothing but energetic particles colliding with the field lines that can connect into the solar wind, and electrons can precipitate and collide, and because the density is so low, you have emission from forbidden lines in, uh, in oxygen and other atoms that produce these beautiful colors. Um, we have satellites devoted to try and understand that as well. This is aurora on this is aurora on Saturn. And I'll stop there. Thank you. for the talk. Questions, please. Yes, Nelly. A hypothetical question. If you have reconnection and you would have a tiny, tiny dust particle in it, what would happen with it? How would it accelerate? The charge test well, particle. Well, if, if it's a test particle, it would be accelerated. If there are sufficient dust particles, it mediates the reconnection process in a fairly complicated way. It can change the way the particles so, for example, we think this process is also important in the way stars form. Stars, in order to form, they have to you know, segregate the magnetic field. They have to kill the magnetic field, right? because otherwise stars wouldn't form. The magnetic pressure would become too big at some point, and the star would never form. So they have to get rid of the magnetic field um, and allow a minimal magnetic field. And people think of ambipolar diffusion as being one of the fundamental processes, but we also believe that magnetic reconnection is strongly involved in allowing the magnetic field to be expelled from a forming star. But that's a very interesting question. In fact, some of those jets that I show you in the chromosphere probably, they don't have dust particles, but they definitely have neutral, <coughs> neutral atoms involved in, in their collision. Um, well, I've always wondered if there's any nanodust in the overall reality, so I haven't seen an answer to that. So. So we know there's, I mean, so Parker's made measurements of the dust in the solar system. So we know that there's an inner minimum distance where there's no dust at all. We've measured that. We've measured this weakening. Inside 15 solar radii, there is essentially dust disappears. It gets completely sublimated, I guess. Um, I'm not an expert. We, we see zodiacal light, of course, and we know that there's lots of dust around. I don't know about, the, I don't know if there's, how much dust is there. I don't think it's, I doubt it's measurable. I think it's, I mean, I don't think there's enough to measure emission from dust particles. So the, the transfer of the energy from the um, photosphere of the magnetic field, is it mainly via the wave process, alphenic waves, or via these little um, reconnection events and flares, nano flares, pico flares? Is it already um, kind of um, dividable into which fraction would be dominant? Okay, so um, I think, and I'm going to go out on a limb here because I think you, you can find five uh, solar physicists, they will give you five different answers. But um, my impression is the following. I think that the process, wave, wave processes are clearly important in lower down, definitely in the chromosphere, shocks form and there's heating associated with these processes in the chromosphere. I think that once we get into the corona, um, the waves per se are probably generated by reconnection events rather than the other way around most of the time. The waves are useful because they survive sufficiently high to push the wind. What do I mean? If you have too many waves close down, um, the heat, plasma, then what's going to happen is that the scale height of the gas is going to go up. Right? You'll have more gas higher up. 
And if you have too much gas at the sonic point, you're going to have a very heavy wind. And if the wind is very heavy, you can't make it go very fast. So the trick in making a very fast wind is not to heat low down, but not to have sufficiently small enough of amount of wind at the sonic point, and then have sufficient number of ways to be able to continue pushing it, because otherwise it would never get to 700 kilometers per second. So I think the waves are important, but probably as a supplementary mecha mechanism in the corona. Lower down, I think the chromosphere um, is, there's contribution from um, shocks and other uh, processes. Is, but does the same apply to all stars, or is it some way depending on size, or? Okay, so, um, of course, there are stars that have a mechanism for generating wind, which is completely different, which is the young stars have radiative winds. Um, but all stars that are you know, even a little bit younger than the sun and you know, smaller than the sun, M, K, et cetera, they all have um, uh, sun-type winds. What we see, though, in some of these faster rotators is the magnetic field is even stronger. They have bigger sunspots. They have bigger clouds in their corona ejected um, at higher speeds. Um, of course, they're harder to measure. This, you know, the sun is a star, is a small thing. But yes, there is signs of activity. And in reality, from what I understand, although we don't measure sunspots in some of the younger type stars, there, are, there is intermediate evidence of the presence of magnetic fields where none were thought to exist. Um, it looks like when you look for magnetic fields, you, you're bound to find them. It's very hard to get not have fields involved somehow. Yeah, I mean, um, one interesting thing that's happened over the last decade, and I say this for astrophysics, people thought that the problem of the Crab Nebula was solved. Um, they, they thought that shocks were doing all the acceleration of particles, Fermi mechanism, etc. And then they realized that for a relativistic particle, the Fermi mechanism, which is basically the fact that if you take two mirrors coming together and you put a particle bouncing between them, it gains energy. So if you have a shock um, and the particle is not going too fast, every time it crosses the shock, it gains energy. It's as though it was a first order Fermi mechanism. But if the particle is relativistic, you can't get it to bounce back. It just leaves. And so you can't really accelerate it very efficiently. But of course, the neutron star has an inclined magnetic field and it's rotating at, you know, 30. 40, 50 hertz. The whole star is rotating, you know, more than once per second. And that has a wind. It's a plasma. And it's an inclined rotator. And there's a light cylinder. And outside the light cylinder, you have a ballerina skirt which is very, very tightly wound with currents flowing backwards and forwards, back and forwards. Magnetic reconnection is happening there. And in fact, we think that some of the bursts that we see in the crab are associated with magnetic reconnection. Work. It was nice to see lots of references to people leading AC teams or right. taking part in AC teams. <laughs> um, Marco, about yeah, a third of the way through your talk, you had plots showing the smooth outflow speed distributions at the poles and then the fluctuations in the equatorial plane. Um, Ulysses, I think that's probably this one here. Yes, exactly. I was just wondering, so the, the relative amount of mass that gets ejected through the smooth regions and the fluctuating regions, what, what, what is it? Well, it's not very large because um, the, the density of the, of the fast solar wind is only a factor of two, two and a half, smaller. And so uh, in the end, the, the total amount of momentum brought out by the, uh, this polar wind is maybe 150% of the slow solar wind, not much more than that. It's about 1.5 in momentum space. Mm -hmm. It's not very, it's not very big. Because this would be important, you know, you, you might ask yourself, what's the shape of the heliospheric shock, right? If the wind is much pushing harder and pushing lower, then what's the shape of the heliosphere? There's a big argument going on about that. But the shape changes, of course, at solar maximum, you know, it's hard to tell, but it is kind of, slightly donut shape, but it's mo this, the speed profile is moderated by the fact that there's higher density here and lower density here. Mm -hmm. So the lower speed 
is compensated by the higher density somewhat. Okay. And I was trying to reconcile as a complete <laughs> outsider to all these studies and, and measurements what you showed us in this figure with that plot from Xi et al. 2021, which you show towards the end with the constant acceleration for different okay, streams. So you have to imagine, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this plot here, so I, what I didn't discuss was something very important, but I didn't really have time, which is the fact that Parker has shown, okay, so the question is, where does the fast and where does the slow wind come from? And let me just briefly say that, because otherwise everything is going to be very cloudy. So I need to say something about that. Let me see if i got to find the right slide here for you. Um, yeah, here we go. So, so, um, so when uh, this is a, this is a, this is white light, and what it shows is basically higher density structures in the solar wind, basically. And when one plots <coughs> the magnetic field structure. One can look at where the, the way the magnetic field emerges from the sun has a very simple mapping or a complicated mapping. Why? Because the current is the gradient, is the curl of the magnetic field. So where the mapping becomes complicated is where currents are likely to form. And this is a map of what's called the Q factor, which shows the regions associated with this big magnetic field being stretched open where very high currents are likely to occur. Now, where you have very high currents and strong heating, you have higher densities and slower wind. Okay. So, probe is now basically in the ecliptic plane. So, it's moving around here. So, it can see fast wind, say, from here. But then it's going to enter this region here and see very slow wind. But, because of the orbit, it can encounter the same stream on the way in and on the way out. Okay. So, so what, she, what we showed in that paper is that even though the solar wind measured by Parker was quite slow, we measure a significant acceleration. So if you look at the speeds that I'm talking about here, the Parker solar probe measurements at 35 solar radii don't see any wind higher than 450 kilometers per second. So, and at, at perihelion, we see things that go between 200 and 300. So forget the blue line, which is probably an error. But these others all show compatible accelerations with each other. You can extrapolate that out now to 200 astronomical units. Uh, so it's going to have uh, solar radii, which is the orbit of the Earth. And what did I come up with? I came up with something like one kilometer per second. So we have to add 130. So here we're at 450. This wind would probably become 560, the orbit of the Earth, if it was linear. Uh, very probably this acceleration kind of saturates a further away. But it's showing that at least between 30 and 70, you know, these are, I mean, these are just two points, right? So you, there's always a straight line, so it's not clear whether it's, you know, it's, you know, it's turning down or not. But it's showing that there's significant acceleration going on. And, you know, we see the alpha waves that are pushing. So this is compatible with the flux of waves that we see at 30. So I think that's interesting. But it happens both for slowest and for faster. But we don't see very fast streams from the polar coronal holes in this, in this particular encounter. Um, we didn't, we haven't, the reason I haven't discussed the fast solar wind in detail very much is that we don't have very many measurements of the fast solar wind yet. But now, hopefully going towards solar maximum, we'll have streams of very fast wind in the ecliptic plane as well. Are the particles of the solar wind confined inside the solar uh, sphere, or are they leaving to interstellar space? So they leave. I mean, the solar wind eventually goes into interstellar space. Now, the process is mediated by all sorts of effects. So the sun is plowing into the interstellar medium. It's moving at about 100 kilometers per second, going around the galaxy. And the solar wind's going at 750. It shocks, it goes slow, and then there's a merging process. In that merging process, you have a lot of charge exchange interactions between neutral atoms in the interstellar medium and protons coming out. And so you have a lot of uh, neutrals coming from the interstellar medium coming into the, into the solar wind, and the leakage, of course, of um, solar wind protons going outwards. 
So there's a whole mission um, called um, IBEX, which has a neutral atom detector, which is very interesting to detect inflowing charge exchange particles from the interstellar medium. Um, and it's shown that the most of the particles comes from a ring. It's not isotropic, so most of these things are coming from a ring, which has an orientation which corresponds, what in one sense is the orientation of the sun motion in the galaxy, and the other is the solar magnetic field uh, e equator. And that provides sort of the direction of this ring of where most of the charge exchange is coming and, and doing this. Um, there's another mission called IMAP, which is going to do this even better. Uh, the principal investigator is Dave McComas um, from Princeton, and it's going to be launched by, within a couple of years. No further questions? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have our apparel, where Marco is our guest of honor.